in the slide deck. Um, I believe there's one change. We added some additional uh, data points that we're going to share in a little bit that is not in this one. So we can we can share that separately. Um, so there's just a couple little things that might look a little different from what we're sharing to what what's getting dropped in there. Um, all right, you can go to the next slide. Let's see if Tim is ready to join us. We appreciate Tim and his partnership with us. And we know um, we wanna make sure OSPI has a presence at these um, to make sure we're all on the same page. That was a lot of the feedback we've received, especially that since we've had so much change um, the last few years with running starts. So Tim, if you are good to go, feel free to start and just let us know how we can help or if you need anything on our end, we can monitor sure. the chat. Yeah, gladly. Uh, yeah, just a little bit of change in the last year. Nothing <laughs> too groundbreaking, right? Um, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Tim McLean. I'm the dual credit program supervisor at OSPI. And um, that essentially means I'm your state level point of contact for anything that, that you have questions about as far as the K-12 partnership um, in Running Start at the at the secondary level. Um, this is a list of uh, questions that or topics that came my way from all of you, I think, funneled through Jamie. And so I um, wanted to touch base on these, but we'll certainly leave some time for any questions you might have or um, happy to join the, the conversations for as long as I'm, I'm available. Um, the first order of business is a real quick hitter. Uh, the spring quarter eligibility adjustment form has been corrected. Um, thanks to all of you, actually, um, we've identified a couple of flaws in multiple iterations of the formula that have uh, come to our attention, even after revising once or revising twice. Um, you've been kind enough to kind of kick it back to us and let us know that there continue to be errors. We think that the version posted right now is the final and working um, version. And Becky McLean, my partner on the fiscal side of the house has been really responsive to getting those corrected when the issues have been brought to our attention. So uh, there is a link on the slide deck, I presume, but don't know for sure that the slide deck is going out. The link is to our dual credit, our program, our, sorry, course-based dual credit website. Um, and so if you navigate to that page on the OSPI website, it's under Running Start Program Details. Um, that is the most correct and final, hopefully, version of the SQEAF. Um, I think Becky would want me to remind you that the SQEAF doesn't need to be completed for every student. This is specifically for students who are likely to exceed or have exceeded the 1.4 FTE limitation um, in the overlap between December and January. So I know on our side, there have been a lot of questions about why am I doing this for every student? You shouldn't be doing that for every student. Um, it's specifically when students are at risk of exceeding the 1.4 AAFTE that you would do that. Uh, so that forms there. Um, a couple things that are under final review, we've been promising for a minute the summer RSEVF, uh, that is coming. I had hoped to have that ready for you today. Um, things moving as they do at OSPI, it's still under review and we wanna make sure that it's 100% right and working. It isn't going to change tremendously from last year's and I know some of you are groaning at that proposition, um, but it is what is familiar and with some more time to roll it out, I think um, we will have fewer issues with that document going into this year. On that note, if you skip down two bullets, we are providing an RSEVF tutorial um, that will roll in the summer RSEVF. It's going to be a recorded on-demand tutorial that is essentially done. It's just waiting for some touching up and hopefully, again, I, I was on leave last week and I thought it would be ready when I returned. Still in the process, but will be released probably in tandem with the summer RSEVF. Um, so those two things are coming. 
And we shared on the listserv a while back a running start calculator. It ain't pretty. It's a very, it's just a useful tool um, in Excel to help with the processing of the RSEVF. Um, it's an Excel formula that we might pretty up and get out there along with these documents. So that will all hit the listserv probably at the same time um, and hopefully next week. Um, we're not sitting on it intentionally. These things have actually been done for quite some time. It's just going through the process right now. So I wanted to make you aware that um, those things are coming. I'm having a hard time reading the chat. So hopefully one of my colleagues can update me as I wrap up um, and my mouse isn't working. So to do that, I have to reach. Um, yeah, no, no worries, Tim. Yeah, it sounds like there, there's a couple questions. Do you wanna just save the questions until the end? Yeah, let's, let's, let's hold them. Um, the rest of this shouldn't take a whole lot of time. There was, um, so moving on from that, there was some interest in learning more about the high school and beyond plan status. And I will point you to that link because if you want information on the high school and beyond plan, there is a 32 page report um, that, that hit the legislative um, recipients in January one, I think was the due date for this. Um, so everything you need to know about the high school and beyond plan is in that report. Um, but some of the highlights it, are essentially that one, that report is available now and the link will take you to it. Um, and from this point on, we've narrowed it down from 21 applicants um, who completed the RFP process to a tune of over 2000 pages of um applications that our seven person team had to wade through. Um, those applicants have been narrowed down to seven finalists. And um, we will be engaging in February through March 8th, as you see there, in some stakeholder surveying. Um, so that information will be going out shortly. It will certainly be shared with um, Jamie and Stephanie and team. Um, for distribution, but those surveys will dive a little bit deeper into you know, what you want to see um, as far as um, these finalists are concerned. There's already been a tremendous amount of stakeholdering done um, with over 250 some responses about the functionality of the high school and beyond plan. Uh, but this will, I think, address more of, of your questions, concerns, things you want brought forward in the review process. And then the vendor interviews occur on March 18th. Um, we've got some days scheduled out or they at least begin March 18th to start narrowing down um, those folks. So I have more to talk about on high school and beyond plan. I don't know how much you want to know. So maybe I'll, I'll let that sit until we get to some questions. Um, but that process is well underway and the report kind of identifies what the process has looked like to date and what's to come. Um, finally, I know there have been a lot of questions about after exit eligibility. This too has been a work in process for a while. I felt like <laughs> I emailed Jamie and Stephanie last night. I felt like we had an answer to this two weeks ago um, and we've just been waiting for it to be finally vetted. As of nine o'clock last night, I think we are finally vetted on um, changing the eligibility for after exit funding to include two subsets of students. One, non-graduating students who have exceeded the AA FTE limitation. That is admittedly going to be a relatively small group because we're talking about 21 credits per quarter. Uh, that they will have to have exceeded to meet that threshold. However, um, after exit eligibility will be extended to students who have maxed out their running start eligibility for the school term and or, <laughs> that or is important, or graduating students within 15 credits of an AA degree. And I will clarify that these graduating students do not need to have met 
the 1.4. So we are trying to interpret the after exit funding as liberally as possible within the language of that proviso. As a lot of you know, like this is a proviso. It was not a bill. We didn't get to weigh in on the language. Um, and so we, we wanted, we've made some changes in interpretation over the years. This is where we've landed for this year. Um, knowing our legislative sponsor's intent better um, and, and just in hearing the feedback from especially your sector, but um, from various places. Um, this is where we've landed. The third group that I'll just throw in there um, would be fifth-year seniors. Um, fifth-year seniors would be would be would fall into that 1.4 AAFTE max group. Um, this opportunity would not be um, restricted to uh, would not be yeah restricted in any way um, to negatively impact fifth year seniors. The only caveat to it is if a fifth year senior is taking advantage of this, just like if they were continuing and running start in any other term, they need to be taking courses that are specifically um, aligned to graduation requirements. So I wanted to put that in there as a caveat. Um, I will just wrap with a couple things that aren't on the slide. Um, to say that we too at OSPI are doing monthly office hours. They are not specifically about dual credit or running start, but the graduation team itself is meeting with anybody who chooses to come every second Wednesday. I will try to get that information out to the listserv so you have an opportunity to drop in. Um, the meetings are relatively informal. We generally will have a slide deck of hot topics and take it from there. Um, but like Jamie led with, um, we too understand the need to have more face time with the practitioners and we'll be um, providing that opportunity. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm available to you. If someone would be so kind as to drop my email in the chat, um, I put this offer out uh, every time I have an opportunity to speak with all of you. If you have um, questions or concerns about things going on on the K-12 side, you're welcome to drop me an email. Um, I've been making a concerted effort to do a little more uh, individual outreach with schools and districts when Things have come to my attention um, in terms of practice that is is questionable or is causing um, consternation on the other side of the of the aisle. So um, do let me know if there's anything that's been coming up for you that's causing heartburn. Um, I will do my best to respond and um, do targeted outreach as necessary. And with that, I yield my time to questions. Thank you, Tim. Let me go back and and I, I plopped in some um, links, Tim, that you mentioned, and I got your email in the chat. Thank you. And so just two. So one comment was it would be great to have the summer RSEVF before the end of April. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, it, it's essentially done. Um, we hope to have it out like yesterday. I'm well aware, and, and and you'll have it before the end of April without question. And then Heather asked, Heather had a question about the SQEAF. Heather, did you did it get answered with Tim, or do you still have a question on it? No. So my question regarding the spring quarter eligibility um, is, you know, I understand we need that adjustment because of the overages in either December or January, um, but now that we have this the summer. And we're having to determine based, to me, it seems like on the annual average FTE for that 1.4 um, for summer, why do we still need this spring quarter eligibility adjustment form? That would probably be a better question for Becky. I'm, I'm not sure I'm tracking how summer impacts the spring overage. The, the challenge that we have in spring is that we have an overlap of quarters 
and I'm probably telling you things you already know. Um, well, but the, the overlap happens in, in winter mm -hmm. and because of the semester to quarter, um, which then brings us to still having to stay within the annualized one point, the average mm -hmm. of the 1.4. Um, but to determine what they're eligible for in the summer, we're having to do the same type of calculation to be within the 1.4 for the year, correct? I'm just correct. trying to understand it. Well, it, there there's a distinction, I think, that needs to be made between the AAFTE and the monthly FTE. And the way that statute or rules are written is that you still need to be on a monthly basis limited to that 1.4. And that's why we have the adjustment because there is a, because of the overlap, there's, there's a um, condition that allows a student to exceed the 1.4 um, in that month but it requires a reduction going forward to maintain the AAFTE. So it's that bizarre combination of monthly FTE, which can't exceed 1.4, and the AAFTE, which still has to remain at 1.4. So if you exceeded okay. the 1.4 in any given month and didn't adjust, then you would push it, you had potentially could push a student over the 1.4. So really it's a it's a safeguard for students not to find themselves at the end of the year having to pay out of pocket is what it really well, why is. Why can't that adjustment be done in summer instead of spring if now that we're allowing for the summer funding? Because there's still the, the I, I'm going to try my best to answer it and then suggest that um, I can bring it over to Becky. But um, because of that, that potential I get what you're saying. I think it's in part probably because this is how this is our level of familiarity. This is what we've been doing and mm -hmm. summer's a new thing. It may not have been fully considered. Um, yeah, let me let me run that yeah. by. We, we have talked about it and Becky has a better answer than I'm articulating. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I just I just this. wanted to bring this this thought up because sure. to me it it makes sense. Um, that was just my my train of thought. If if we're yeah. now adding into the summer and and the summer's part of that annualized average, why do we have to take it out of their spring? That was just my thought. Thank you. No, that thank you. That clarification helps. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. I have another question. I think from Chelsea. Question about the AA or AAS degree and high school diploma awarding through the college. Chelsea, do you want to elaborate for Tim? Yeah, thank you. It, it does not have to do with what's on the slide. So I don't, I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of pushback from high school counselors that um, they, there just seems to be a lack of understanding that students can earn their high school diploma through the college once they complete an associate degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I send them the link to the RCW and they're just, there seems to just be some confusion around that. Um, I've had some high school partners that seem pretty well versed and like they even have a document that says the student and family understands that they are not getting their high school diploma through the home high school, but they're still accessing running start and have to remain enrolled at their local high school but the plan is for them to get their high school diploma by finishing their AA degree. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there can be some sort of training or something like that um, for the high school side, just so that they have an understanding that we build an education plan for the student at the college so that they can get their associate degree done in time so that they don't run out of running start funding and mm -hmm. they're gonna get their high school diploma through the college. Um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's something that can even be um, created state at the state level as a procedure or some sort of document that can be sent out where there's an agreement between 
the high school, the college, and the family that says this is the understanding of what the student is trying to accomplish. Um, but I, I just get a, a lot of pushback on that. And there just seems to be a lot of misunderstanding from the high school side. That, thank you. That's a great point. As you were speaking, it occurred to me that that would be wise to incorporate into the high school and beyond plan. Um, I think that's a, a perfect platform and place to elevate that. Um, so yes, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'm taking note of it and I'm going to pass it along to Jill Deal if you have any questions as our high school and beyond plan expert um, and was newly hired to manage that. So um, if, if you have any questions or thoughts on the high school and beyond plan, um, last name is Deal, D-I-H-L, first name Jill. But thanks, yeah. Chelsea, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I think also um, we, we can, you know, we regularly meet now or we have been for like the last for a while now, but we can also talk about like, does it make sense to have some template for you all to use to ensure everyone's on the same page? Um, we're gonna talk about this later, but Stephanie and I are working with several of you to create a training video for high school counselors. Might be an opportunity to, can't do anything too detailed probably on this, but there could be opportunity to plug it in, plug in the link to the RCW, et cetera. So um, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, next question, Tim. This is from Teresa Ramos. Uh, I want to verify that rising juniors are eligible for up to 10 credits for summer quarter prior to their junior year, and that will not impact their FTE for their junior year. That's been mentioned in earlier meetings. Correct. Yep. Um, completing sophomores, i.e. rising juniors, um, are permitted to access 10 running start credits. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's a confirmation, but also an opportunity to clarify um, that these students um, are eligible for 10 credits after exit eligibility, which I touched on before, is 15 credits. Um, so that distinction probably needs to be really clear too, is that when you're talking about students who have FTE, capacity who have not maxed out, um, they go into the summer, whether they're a rising junior or a continue a rising senior or a fifth year senior, they're going into the summer with a 10 credit max. It's these students who have already maxed out um, their FTE or are graduating that are allowed 15. Uh, does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, this is just the way that the two, the legislation versus the proviso were written, um, but that's a good point of clarification to provide. So Tim, can I just, so seniors, current juniors in our program, rising seniors would be limited to 10 credits as well? If they were, if they were operating under, with FTE capacity. So they, oh, right. That, that's right. Most, we're going to use that most, calculator. <laughs> yeah. So most of them, yes. Um, it would be those very rare few that took 21 credits a quarter and maxed out their FTE that ironically would be eligible for more. Um, yeah. And so new seniors who start in the fall yep. would have that 10 credit eligibility for summer as well. Correct. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, this is from Jackie asking about the adjustment form again, asking if that replaces the EBF for spring quarter. And then are community colleges completing the table to calculate the credit eligible? Yeah, so the, the spring quarter adjustment does not replace the RSEBF. Um, and I think there are instructions on the form that, that gets attached to the RSEBF. Um, so they are, it is not one or the other, it's both. And um, yeah, you should still be using the RSEVF table and only, again, only use utilizing the SQEAF, the spring quarter adjustment form, if you have students who are at risk of exceeding the FTE. That is not a form that is going to be used, especially now that we've moved to 1.4, that, that doesn't need to be used for every student. That's used for students who have been taking high volumes of running start um, only. 
So when you identify a student who's taken their 21 credits or, you know, I've, I've really been pushing the limits, you would use that form, but it's not for all. Thanks, Tim. Um, next one's from Carly. Can Running Start students pursue, can Running Start students who are pursuing Washington State issued high school diploma through the college be eligible for the summer Running Start funding after senior year if they're under the 15 credits remaining on the degree? Let me parse that out. <laughs> <laughs> pursuing a diploma through the college. Give me part two. Yeah. Um, are they eligible for summer running start funding after their senior year? So I believe this is the, the after exit funding they're asking about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if they're within 15 credits of that degree, um, then they would be eligible for after exit funding. Tim, I thought, so just, just to clarify, I thought in that proviso it had to be, they were pursuing their high school diploma through the school district, not through us. Is that, I thought they weren't eligible, but I'm not, I don't want to, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. That's right. Cause they're not graduating. They're actually not graduating. Um, yeah, I, I I think that's a no, you're right. Um, if they are not graduating through the district and have not maxed out their FTE, you're right, that's a no. If they've maxed out their FTE, the, the graduating piece is a moot point. So if they have maxed out their FTE, they would um, not, but, they could still participate if they, well, if they weren't graduating and they have a FTE capacity, sure, they could. They could continue to participate um, because they're, they're still a traditional student with access to summer running start provided they didn't max out their FTE. So if they haven't maxed out, they can access summer within the running start program, but they wouldn't qualify for the special proviso after exit funding. Yeah. Ooh, it's complicated. It does. And, <laughs> and, and I'll just say, I, I don't know the future of um, the after exit proviso. Um, I will only say that from what we know, that ends this year. This is the last, um, the last budget cycle of the biennium is, is this summer. Um, and whether it is reintroduced is anybody's guess. My, my, my suspicion is that the 1.4 was designed to eliminate the need for such a uh, proviso. Um, so my thinking is that we wouldn't have to be splitting hairs in years to come around this, um, but I just don't know. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, Lori, I think so for your question for after exit, just AA or AAS tech degrees, yeah, basically the language for the after exit is that there are 15 credits away from any do so any degree but it needs to be a degree so not a certificate yes yeah. and sorry, I think, can you just can i just oh, ask sorry. a clarifying question so yeah. the after exit proviso that's like a separate bucket of money it it's is. not connected to the 1.4 bucket it's a different right. bucket of money okay got it thank you yeah which is why it's a little bit challenging um because I, I know there's frustration around having to follow different processes for different populations of students. Um, the way this has been set up, there's just no way around that. This isn't a student's basic education allocation, which is what would fund a traditional running start student. It is a separate pot of money. So when the resources go out for tracking um, these after exit students, as frustrating as it may be, don't get mad at me <laughs> or Jamie um, or anybody else. It, it just, it is what it is. Um, it's a different pot of money that needs to be accounted for separately. And Carly, you're just to clarify, you're asking about exit funding going away. So yeah, it was a proviso from last year that was set for this for summer 23 and summer 24. And as Tim mentioned, we don't have like a full answer, but our guess is 
it will go away because of the 1.4 is going to open access. So we shouldn't see the problem of uh, not being able to complete. So we can't say for sure, but I think we're all on the same page. We, we're assuming this will be the end of it. So. Okay, also a clarifying question. Graduating seniors are not eligible for summer running start and must use after exit, correct? If they, yeah, if they're a graduating senior, they, they are not eligible for the general running start. They can use after exit if they're 15 credits away from a degree. Right. If it's more than that, they're, yeah. they, they can't use it. If they are taking the step of graduating, if, if they are graduating, they don't generate state funding any longer. Running Start, as you probably know, is funded with the basic education allocation that's generated by an enrolled student. Once that student graduates, they're no longer enrolled. They're not generating funding to be used towards Running Start. So once they've graduated, they're done. Unless they're within 15 credits. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Anyone else? Look, okay. A limit on how many credits a rising senior can take in the summer. That's the 10 credits. Mm -hmm. And that's also dependent upon what they've already accrued with their with their FT. Right, right. No, that, wait, that's wait. a maximum. Yes, yeah. maximum 10. So there, there may be a rising senior who doesn't have capacity to take all 10 credits because they've used up most of their FTE over the course of the year. If you have a student who went... 21 credits, 21 credits, 18 credits, they're not likely to have a full 10 credit um, capacity for the summer. So, you know, keep that in mind. That That's what, when the RSEVF, summer RSEVF comes out, you know, it'll have that table to calculate it for you. Um, uh, so, so just know the 10 credit is a maximum. It's not a guarantee. It's an, thank you for the question. That's an important distinction. So that's all in the chat, but I'd open it up if there's anyone else that has any questions for Tim before we move forward. Well, I'll just add along that same line, the 15 credits for after exit, that too is a maximum, not a guarantee. Students who are within 15 credits of an AA, they need to be taking, I should have put that on the slide. They need to be taking the courses that are going to satisfy that degree requirement, not acute accruing additional credits. So if a student comes in and they're 10 credits from an AA, they take 10 credits, not 15. Thank you, Tim. Really? Oh, we got a question from Michelle. Yeah, sorry. Just one clarifying question my team had and wanted um, me to ask. So for seniors the summer after, um, they they solely are eligible for the after exit funding, right? There is not, um, there's not funding for that summer afterwards, whether they have graduated. If they're graduating, then they don't, they're only eligible um, for the after exit for a degree, right? right? And they're only eligible if they're 15 credits away from a degree. If it's okay. more than that, they're not going to be eligible for that funding. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anything else for Tim? Get him off the hot seat? It's warm. <laughs> warm. It's not hot yet. Tim, we appreciate you taking time. This this is really great to have the presence of OSPI, and we know it's a crazy time. So thank you, and feel free to stick around as long as you want, or yeah. drop off. And if there's anything else that comes up that we need to clarify, we'll we'll touch base with you and get that information back to the colleges. Awesome. Yeah, I'll hang on for a bit. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So wanted to throw out um, a couple bills. So we are in our supplemental uh, legislative section. So this isn't the big one, the biennium one, which was last year. I, as you all, if you were around, you know, it was a little crazy and which is basically uh, created all the conversations we just had was from last year. Um, but some, some bills, uh, usually what we see, bills that didn't get through all the way usually come back. Um, and so a couple of the ones that we had last year that got stuck in, I think a couple of them got stuck in rules. And so they just, they never made it um, pass on and to, for a vote. They're back around again. 
Um, the first one is House Bill 1146. That hasn't been set for a uh, hearing at this point. It's still in rules, but it's been brought back. And that's notifying high school students and their families about available dual credit uh, programs and financial assistance. So what basically that means <clears throat> is it's requiring that the, the high schools notify the students every semester about the dual credit opportunities and any financial assistance that might be available to them. Um, so it's, it's a pretty short bill and it's just kind of tagging onto what's already in statute. Um, with college and high school and Running Start to ensure that all of our students and families are getting accurate and timely information um, for all dual credit programs in Washington State. Um, the other one that's come back that you may remember is Senate Bill 5670, permitting 10th grade students to participate in Running Start in online settings. That's in rules too, so there hasn't been a hearing. Um, I, I think we shared concerns around that. Um, I mean, there, there are several concerns I think most people share. One is academic readiness at 10th grade, the readiness to do it online, um, and then also the impact of um, our colleges, and, well, and K-12, but we would have to be tracking and ensuring they were only doing online classes because it's only online available to them. And I'm sure, as you know, that that's a challenge in itself. So um, I will I will make sure to let you know if it goes further. We've already shared these concerns last year um, and concerns around um, how students choose classes in the catalog and that the catalog is open to them. And we can't just in statute, we shouldn't be, you know, they, picking and choosing specific courses for running start. So it brings up a lot of questions. I don't know where this will go, but I'll make sure to keep you all informed. Um, and I think generally we're probably on the same page with OSPI and on some concerns with that. We'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, the other one is not necessarily Running Start specific, but I wanna make sure you know about it. Um, you may know that we had a House Bill 1835 a couple years ago where it provided outreach specialists to our, um, with our educational service districts and high schools to provide um, assistance in FAFSA and WAFSA uh, completions. So financial aid assistance, getting students to make sure that they've, they've completed everything and then enrolling at a post-secondary institution. This bill kind of expands it and changes it up a little bit where it's um, it would be that our community technical colleges providing or a CBO or possible tribal organization to provide an outreach persistence specialist at the ESDs and then going out to the high schools to provide not only FAFSA, WASFA, but also general enrollment information um, and advising and connecting them to student services earlier while they're still in high school to kind of help bridge that transition from K-12 to post-secondary. That just dropped yesterday. So a lot of people don't know about it. We'll talk about it more, but just want you to know that's where it's at. It's a pilot, so colleges would need to apply for the funding. It's not, you know, it's not mandated. And if it did pass, there would be funding associated with it to pay for those, for those expenses. Uh, those are the three right now that are um, up there. And then I will make sure, it's still the beginning of session. It's a quick session, but I'll make sure to let you all know if anything pops up. And when we, Every month that we meet, I'll make sure too that I've updated you on what's going on in that. Um, but what I also wanted to do was show you um, updated enrollment data. I'm, I'm excited. I don't know if you've been tracking your numbers at your local college, but we're up. Well, I shouldn't say we are still in recovery mode from the pandemic, but from last year, we're up 15% in enrollment of FTE for Running Start students. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so right now our system totals for fall 23 is 25,153. Um, and we pulled some, we've been working with our research area to also look at some of our previous cohorts to give you any updated information on the success of students. And it's relative, it's been, what I'm giving you is what we've already been talking about and sharing. So that hasn't changed, but it's still good to know if you don't that about 25% of our students are earning an associate's degree while they're in Running Start. And then an additional 13 earn their associate's degree within two years of their last Running Start enrollment. And then may, some of you may know this already, but we have a really high um, pass rate for our Running Start students. It hovers between 90 and 91 usually. So right now students are passing their classes at a rate of 90%. So these are just some nuggets to take when you're having conversations or if there's people concerned about pass rates or enrollment, these are things you can share at the system level. Um, when we get further along in the presentation, I'll also show you how you can pull up 
information on the dashboard that you can look for your local college or at, at, as a whole, because you all have access to that um, on the on the SBCTC space. Um, any questions regarding the the bills or the enrollment information I just provided? And before I let Stephanie take on um, going over our survey results. All right, Stephanie, I'm gonna give it to you. All right, thank you, Jamie. All right, and good morning, everyone, again. Um, so I had the honor of um, really deep diving into the Running Start Program survey uh, information that you all so graciously provided us during the fall of 2023. Um, we had, we put out a Running Start Program survey to our CTCs, all of you, thank you. And um, we had 28 uh, community technical colleges respond and everyone uh, showed interest in participating in quarterly meetings for Running Start College programs, which is, again, um, we really uh, did a deep dive into what you all had told us uh, based on the survey. And um, a lot of our work um, currently and moving forward is really gonna be guided by the information you've provided us uh, for the survey and then moving forward in these, these series that we um, have monthly. So thank you. I think first first and foremost, thank you to you all for taking the time to do this. I know it was um, a pretty heavy uh, lift in terms of uh, just dedicated time to responding to our questions and understanding um, uh, structure and what is going on um, at each uh, community technical college with, with Running Start. So thank you very much. All right. So let's move on to uh, some of the survey results here. So um, one of the questions we asked was, what was working well with Running Start at your college? And so um, these were definitely some common themes uh, um, amongst the 28 uh, responses. So internal and external collaboration um, that community technical colleges had um, just really great collaborative efforts like within their college and then out in the community to support students. Um, there were several colleges that indicated their shared caseload model uh, was something that was working really well. So not having necessarily one dedicated advisor that students would go to, but sharing that, um, that advising uh, within a team model. Uh, personalized attention for students and families. And so that really uh, captures many different aspects. So um, personalized email, personalized one-on-one -on -one meetings for students and families, basically the sense of students and families feeling as though they are um, being heard and reached out to individually and treated as an individual student and, and um, having that relationship was something that was working well. And we saw that across the board at, at many different community technical colleges. Um, having one point of contact for Running Start students was reported as working well. So um, what we mean by that is having basically uh, somewhere to go for Running Start students uh, are those interested in Running Start. So that could be one point person or it could be a program um, and several different uh, folks for Running Start. Um, the next bullet point there is um, a micro version of an overall division is working well. And so what we mean by that is uh, basically having a whole running start program that functions like a division. So uh, and, and there was a lot of variety across the board there. So um, so, you know, handling registration, processing, um, running start applications, uh, advising having all of those things housed uh, within um, like a running start program at the college. So that seemed to be overall folks were reporting that as a very positive experience um, at their community technical college. Uh, good faculty relationships was reported as something that was working really well. Um, strong high school relationships. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, on, on one of the next slides here. Uh, dedicated advisors for specific school districts. So having us uh, like bigger school districts, having point person, uh, a point advisor uh, to, to, um, to work with for their student population. And then in-person availability was reported um, by several different community technical colleges of staff uh, for, for students and, and families and interested folks in Running Start. And it was really interesting with this question that we had asked, um, Many different community technical colleges uh, had also just shared, you know, th these are all things that are going well, but we also are understaffed, overworked, and we need some more support. So even with this positive question, 
um, it was very much coming across during the survey that overall everyone is feeling very um, uh, overworked and understaffed at, at many different um, at, or or most um, community technical colleges in terms of Running Start. And we'll get to that um, in a little bit more detail here in a minute. Okay, so uh, what does communication and training opportunities look like to K-12 partners from Running Start program staff? And so um, there was definitely a lot of um, variety here, but I, I think this is so, so important to share with you all because you all are doing some fantastic work and um, collaboration with your K-12 partners. Um, many, many, many colleges uh, shared that they have some type of annual high school staff event on the community technical college campus. So whether that's a like an annual breakfast, like a high school summit, partnerships and pathways, I think one college called it, um, K-12 partner gathering, and it kind of de depended when that was offered. Uh, many community technical colleges were doing fall. Um, others were waiting till uh, January to, to do something like this. And it wasn't necessarily specific for running start. It um, sometimes was called like a high school um, connections uh, annual event, but the college is putting it on. So that was um, very common across the board. Um, regular communi email communication on deadlines and updates. And again, that the frequency of that varied, whether that was kind of going out quarterly to K-12 partners, monthly or weekly. Um, and it varied also depending on um, who was sending that information out about a Running Start program. Uh, and what I mean by that is director, assistant director, advisor, um, program specialist, it really varied. Um, running start specific web pages with updated resources and videos. So having somewhere, some type of updated platform uh, where you can direct your K-12 partners to with the most updated information about what's going on with your running start program um, was definitely mentioned several times. Uh, a running start, so these are kind of um, like a running start information nights or sessions. So that could be um, to high school staff specifically. Um, or also welcoming parents and students, virtual and in-person seminar, seminars for high school staff, um, running start steering committee, one of the community technical colleges reported, which I thought was a, a all these are wonderful ideas, um, but having some type of regular steering committee that helps um, facilitate what that looks like in your, your district and uh, at your college. Uh, high school counselor manual developed by program staff. So one in particular college actually created a high school counselor manual uh, to work with the high school counselors in the district. And it was very specific for their for their college and for their, their districts that they were working with. Um, quarterly trainings, meetings, luncheon for high school staff, and then visiting high schools in person. And that also, the frequency really varied across the board with that piece. Okay, and so we have uh, several different themes here that we saw with the program um, survey. Um, Oh, yep, I guess I've got some comments. Sorry, I'm just reading some comments. We can get to those in a minute, too. Um, uh, so anyways, there's several different themes um, that we saw. And the four themes we really saw looking at this information was communication, um, data management and reporting, legislative update and literature, and then staffing training and professional development. And so one of the things I want to say, too, is... Um, these were uh, this particular part of this is was answers to how can um, the state board uh, dual credit better assist you? And then is there anything else you'd like us to know? And so the themes we're about to, to um, look at and, and diving into these four here uh, were as a result of those two questions, answering those two questions. And um, one of the things I want to say, too, is, you know, we may not have a solution for some of these points that I'm going to share in a minute. Uh, but we definitely are um, looking into how we can address um, these themes and important points and um, what we can do to um, continuously improve. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone again for taking the time to, to respond and really um, articulate many of these points um, because it's just really important for us to receive that information so we can um, make plans moving forward. And so um, thank you again for that. All right, so communication. Um, some of the themes we saw were, there was a request for updated contact information for our community technical college uh, running start programs. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through all these themes and then um, Jamie is going to provide some updates and goals for us as a department um, after I share all this information from the survey. 
So I'm just going to kind of read it and then we'll we'll talk about what we're doing um, in a little bit here. Um, concerns about the partnership between OSPI and SBCTC. Uh, ensuring everyone has access to the most updated information and resources available pertaining to Running Start. So those were the big themes with communication. Um, when it comes to data management and reporting, uh, frustration with the current Running Start billing report in CTC Link, need for real-time student data sharing system to streamline processes, suggestions to revisit and improve the Running Start EVF and CTC Link processes. And then legislative updates and literature, uh, requests for continued legislative updates and literature, uh, clarity on regulations to hold high schools accountable for information for informing students and families about Running Start, and the request for advance notice of policy changes. And then finally, uh, staffing, training, and professional development. Uh, there were concerns about um, CTC Running Start programs being understaffed, overworked, and underpaid. As I mentioned earlier, that was definitely a theme uh, with many of the different questions and how folks chose to answer. Uh, the need for training high school counselors on Running Start. And then requests for Running Start Basics 101 sessions to onboard new employees and improve knowledge among staff. And then finally, clarification on state-mandated practices versus institutional mandates practices. So those were our big themes. Um, and so one where I wanna move next here is staffing. So there were several questions about what does staffing look like with your Running Start um, students at your community technical college? And so I will say across the board, responsibilities and um, positions varied. Um, <laughs> there wasn't one kind of model for all. And so um, the and this particular question that we looked at, um, uh, we, one of the um, one of the questions we asked was, if your college has des dedicated Running Start advisors, please describe in detail what the position is responsible for. So um, these four categories here was uh, an attempt to try to um, put similarities together. So across the board, we saw a lot of varieties, right? But there there definitely seemed to be kind of like four categories of of what folks kind of fell into in terms of positions. Uh, director, associate director, supervisor, manager, and or program coordinator. Um, some colleges had several of those positions, some had none. Um, then there was kind of like the chunk of advisor, navigator, educational planner, career counselor, and or success coach. And also kind of related faculty advisor or faculty counselor. And then um, we also kind of had a group of like program specialist, program assistant, office assistant, or customer service specialist. Um, so it really, you know, varied depending on um, what college we were looking at, uh, what folks actually had in terms of positions. So um, it was really fascinating to really look at this and just um, see the variety across the board. And so kind of getting back to that question that I just had proposed, one of the, the questions in the survey was, if your college has dedicated running start advisors, um, what is that position responsible for? And so there was a lot of variety. Um, we had some directors that um, also have caseloads of students, some directors, associate director, supervisor, manager, program coordinator also um, were overseeing additional programs um, or they were solely doing just administrative tasks. So it really varied depending on what we were looking at, um, who did what. Um, and then some advisors at colleges are responsible for also marketing and outreach, new student orientations, book loan programs. Um, they manage registrations so students don't register themselves, referral to resources, monitoring alert systems, billing reports. Some advisors were doing those pieces and data collection um, in addition to academic and career counseling and planning. So it really varied tremendously across the board. Um, as to what model um, was offered at each college. Okay, um, and so one of the questions we had was, does your Running Start program live in instruction or student services? And out of the tw 28 um, community technical colleges that responded, 25 uh, were in the student services realm and um, three were in instruction. And then this was something I, I wanna give a little bit of a preface here before we really do a deep dive in. Um, so this was, um, so 
what you're seeing on your screen here is running start FTE enrollment um, based on the academic year of 2022-2023. Um, what we included here was we just pulled um, the annual FTE uh, by district of the um, community technical colleges that responded to the survey. So not everyone is included here. I will just preface that. And then um, what we did was uh, we went through um, and we looked at self-reported staff FTE um, on that second category there. So um, I, I say that with hesitance because there um, definitely um, there may be a little room for error in some of, of the FTE reported there. And what I mean by that is um, some folks may have said, oh, we have a director that's 1.0 FTE with advisor, two advisors that are, you know, each 1.0 FTE, um, but that director could um, also have duties with college and the high school, um, other high school programs. And so some, some colleges may have not split that out. Um, so take this with a grain of salt, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because this was self-reported based on the survey results. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating to have just to refer to. Um, and I will say there's um, two colleges up there, Bellingham and Big Bend, that I just put no exclusive staff. That just meant that um, they don't necessarily have any specific running start staff um, based on our program. Uh, survey that went out. So um, they they kind of, um, you know, they have uh, just a, a different model to support Running Start students. So um, yeah, so I thought that was uh, really interesting to, to dive into and take a look at, at the numbers there. Um, and then uh, the, the other thing that we wanted to point out, and I think, um, Jamie, correct me if you're, I'm wrong, I think Jamie is going to show us how to um, look up data, enrollment data with the state board. Um, and the link is on the PowerPoint that Kaylee so graciously shared. Um, so go ahead and Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so I just realized you've got to shop, stop sharing screen, huh? You know, so one option we could do is we could do this towards the end and I can share it. So we stay on, I don't, yeah, let's, if you're good, I think you're, we're on the same page. So let's let me, I'll show you some of the stuff at the end that makes more sense. But I also did plug in um, in the chat the link to where you can access that same information. But I don't wanna, um, I think we're on a good place. So let's just keep going. Perfect, sounds good. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, so we'll show you that all in a little bit, um, but you certainly can pull uh, this data as well. So, um, and and play around with, with FT and headcount as well. So, all right, um, we're gonna go ahead and move on here. And oh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jamie to share based on um, our survey results and um, just what we've been planning with our uh, SBCTC dual credit department. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And we can, we can definitely tag team some of these. Um, <clears throat> so Stephanie came on board um, this summer. Uh, and so it's it's been pretty great. Um, she's got a lot of background um, in dual credit and youth re-engagement work in our CTC system. and feel like now with Kaylee too, uh, we have more capacity to do more um, in this realm. Uh, still plenty to do, but I want to share some of the things we are currently working on. So the first one, as you know, we're starting to do some of these Running Start series to see how they go. Um, we'd like to also do that for college and the high school. Um, we just haven't yet. Um, Running Starts, you know, more students, more people involved. So we'll start there and then, and then work on some college and the high school series that we can do. Um, we are um, updating our dual credit website, so updating with new videos um, from prior um, trainings or webinars we've had, so you all have access to that. Uh, we are also working on a high school counselor video recording. Um, OSPI is doing some additional um, trainings, too, for high school counselors, and we offered to provide like um, a recording on um, how to advise students in this 1.4 model, what do ed plans look like, just tips and advice from our colleges. So we've tapped several of you um, that's, that have shown interest to participate in that. And we're hoping to get all that recorded in February, early February. So that can be a video that OSPI can have on their website, our website. The counselors can pick up any time. We know they're busy where they can get some key information from us at the agency, but more from the local colleges that are doing the work that work with counselors all the time. So thank you in advance for the people that have volunteered to help with that. Um, we're also trying to have a bigger presence um, uh, with Wisher. So Wisher is our Washington, call, uh, Washington Council for High School and College Relations. Never get this right. Um, a lot of you know, I don't know if Anne's on the call today, but 
lot of you know Ann Melinda. She's the current president for the board. Um, at, she, she's at South Puget Sound. And <clears throat> there's a dual credit commission within that, that um, group. And you may know at one time we, there was a big conference that was going to be held for dual credit. That had to get canceled. That's right when the pandemic started. And we've been really trying to like rethink what this could look like. Um, so we're really hoping to work closely with our university partners and OSPI to figure out how we can bring back, um, if you've been here, or is, I feel like I've been doing this work for a long time, but way back when, when I was running a Running Start program, we used to have these quarterly get-togethers where we had all the agencies there, <clears throat> we had the AG there, we always were talking about questions and we're trying to bring something back similar, but also some professional development networking opportunities so you can engage more with our high school partners, share best practices that are working in certain regions, et cetera. So we're looking at what that could look like within Wisher so that it is, um, it, it's, it's inclusive of everybody with Running Start at the university level, at the K-12 level, uh, level and us, along with college and high school, and also looking at our career and technical education dual credit. So that's in the works. We have a Running Start residency work group right now. Um, we are working with ARC to figure out um, some mm, better practices on handling residency for Running Start students. And when I say that, I mean, we, you know, we don't ask those questions to students. It's not a requirement for Running Start. We have to be very careful with that. Um, but when students take the low college level or they exceed their 1.4, which we should see less of, um, <clears throat> they have to pay tuition. And when you pay tuition, we have to de determine residency. So how do we do that in a way that is um, not creating barriers for students, that it, we're still inclusive and welcoming, but also ensuring that our registrars have the information they need for the tuition count. So we've got a group together of registrars and Running Start directors and um, trying to figure out what that could look like and what we could provide as a system to, to make it a little bit cleaner cleaner and student more student focused friendly. Um, I'm gonna let Stephanie talk about the math placement grant, but I'll just provide a quick overview. We, um, uh, College Spark, we went into agreement with College Spark a couple years ago regarding the math placement grant. <clears throat> and the focus was how do we streamline um, math placement as it relates to transcript and recent high school graduate, recent high school grads. Because it's all over the map and how can we do this more in a system approach um, and, and do it in a more equitable way uh, and so we have this grant that we started in the fall. Stephanie's been our lead on this work. Um, so I'll let Stephanie just uh, share a couple of minutes on that because I do think it, it definitely relates to Running Start, definitely relates to that K-12 K K partnership. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, so I had the pleasure of um, facilitating our November math placement grant convening in Wenat at Wenatchee Valley College. And um, we had uh, 21 community technical colleges attend. Uh, so thank you, some of you. I see some, some familiar faces and names. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is create a universal high school transcript placement policy um, that we can then pilot with colleges um, to kind of have um, some equity across the board for students. Because if a student's experience is if they go to one of our CTCs, placement may look very different at one versus another. And not that it needs to be exactly the same, but having some um, similarity of processes and um, uh, what high school class is going to equate to what you know uh, level placement in our system um, would be very helpful for students across the board. So that's one of our goals is to have a universal math placement policy. Um, and um, so we are working on that. Uh, we have our next um, uh, uh, actually virtual convening next week on uh, January 25th. And then we have a in-person convening um, April 25th at Tacoma Community College. So um, uh, some of our goals, though, associated um, outside of the universal math placement is um, having some recommended placement policy um, in relation to CTC Lincoln placement. So having one recommendation um, of this is how we should do this as a system um, so that we can help provide guidance and, again, kind of um, bring our system together when it comes to placement. And then long-term goal, um, one of the long-term goals is to... Um, 
uh, as a state board, be able to uh, have a place for placement because we really don't have um, a platform for that at the state board um, of these are our recommendations. These are some things that really work well. So that would be kind of our long term goals when it comes to math and also uh, English. So that's a that's a really quick update. Um, but yeah, really excited about the work that we've been doing so far and where we're going to go with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will share, uh, yes, and we have, um, thanks, Lindsay, and we, I will we'll mention, like, there's, we have placement reciprocity, um, in our state where we honor it. We're hoping to get to a place where the student doesn't have to get placed someplace, one, one college, and then say, this is where I got placed at TCC, and now I want to take it to Centralia. The hope is that they know when I place in Algebra 2, I know my next step should be, let's just say, staff. And that these colleges will automatically, without having to share a placement from another place, to go to the other. Anyway, I'm saying that that's not very clean. But anyway, we're working on it. We're excited, um, and uh, it's it's a work in progress. But we're really happy with the turnout and the investment from colleges, especially faculty, um, advisors, and staff in this work. So kudos to Stephanie. This is a lot. We have a good group at the state board working on it. So thank you, and kudos to CGT Link folks. Um, I will share too, this is not on here, but we really are trying to do a better job of training and, and making sure your needs are um, listened to and our best and to our best ability, try to fix some of that stuff with CTC Link. I think you saw Brandon Reed was here for the first hour um, <clears throat> and he runs our CTC Link financials. He's been amazing. His team has been amazing. They've helped us through the ESSER grants, all of these changes are running start and he's always open for changes you want to make that make sense globally. Uh, and so we're really in contact with them a lot to share concerns and, and, and make fixes as needed. Um, and then we um, are also working with um, the, our campus solutions team regarding placement and figuring out a better method of um, uh, inputting placement into CTC Link. So um, updated running start, contact us. We're working on that. Um, we're working on an updated one for college and high school too. Um, now that we have some staffing, it's a little bit easier to make those changes. Um, so it's not as outdated as it has been. And just continuing updates on our dual credit webpage and just ensuring that we are really following a universal design approach with accessibility with our materials, our videos. Uh, that's an important piece. We uh, we didn't mention this either, but we are working with um, the Disability Services Council um, and uh, Monica Olson, who's our policy associate at the agency. Um, to figure out how we're doing a better job of uh, accommodations for students, streamlining those, um, being transparent, um, removing barriers. We do have some work to do in the disability realm when it comes to dual credit. So that's a continued process, but we're excited that we're working on it as well. Um, so let's see here. I So we've got 40 minutes left. We do want to break you all out. Um, but I'm thinking if Stephanie's okay with it, let's open it up for just if there's any questions you all have um, before we break out um, for us, because we've gone through a lot of stuff. So maybe we can stop sharing for a moment and just open it up and see if you have any questions. Oh yeah, Katie, I think you're asking about information on the OSP office hour, I, OSPI. I don't, I think Tim said he didn't have it yet, but I'll follow up because I think he was going to maybe send it on the list. Or... And also, no, the placement grant, we haven't put much on the website because it's kind of like this pilot small, like grant. Um, but Stephanie would be more, I'm sure enough, would be more than happy to discuss more in detail about what's going on with that. And we will have a report and more information towards the, you know, in the summertime when we have, uh, we'll be putting some stuff together for College Spark too. Um, okay, Tim's gonna get that on the listserv. Any questions so far for us about what we're working on? Uh, anything big that we 